We have a very special guest with us today, the world famous record producer from right here in New Orleans, Black and Mild. Everybody please give him a warm welcome. Um, he has been at the forefront of New Orleans music for over 20 years. He has worked with pretty much every bounce artist you could think of. Um, Magnolia Shorty, Big Frida, I mean, Juvenile, I mean, pretty much everybody. And plus, so many non-New Orleans artists, everybody from Young Jeezy to Missy Elliott to... Um, Snoop Dogg, and then, of course, most famously now, Drake, right? I think that's worth a round of applause, don't you? So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I, we, we want uh, some of the students in the program to ask some questions as well. We just had a little meet and greet with the students upstairs, and we're going to continue that conversation. I have some questions as well, more about your early life and the early part of your career. But I thought it would be fun, with your indulgence, if we start with a brief video, something that we found online, which I think is super cool, and especially for our beat making and audio production students who are here, there's this really cool video in which you talk about the work that you did on the Drake tracks, uh, in my feelings in this particular case, and uh, it's really interesting because you, you discuss in some really cool detail what the track was like when you first got it, and then all the things that you did to make it into the hit record that it became. So guys, could we uh, see the video? Energy on, in my feelings when I first got it, I didn't think it was gonna be what it, what it turned out to be. I ain't gonna lie. When I first got the record, it sounded like this. Kiki, do you love me? Are you writing? Say you never ever leave from beside me, cause I want you. It didn't have a lot of beat in it, it didn't, and it was very slow. Like the record was slow. The tempo and the energy is a little down from nice for what? So me and Drake decided to speed it up together. The Magnolia Shorty sample comes from a record that me and Shorty did on top of a Jada Kiss and Jasmine Sullivan record called Smoking Gun. Let's go, let's go, let's go. You're the only one I love. You are the only one I can trust. And if I ever sleep. Even before she died, she was one of a kind, only one that's gonna ever had that sound. If you listen to the record to what Drake's saying, uh, the Magnolia Shorty sample fits right there. He said, Kiki, do you love me? She come back, you the only one I love. That just fit it perfect. Rock that ass! Rock. You the only one I love! Rock, rock, rock that ass! Rock that ass! Rock. You the only one I love! Rock, 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 rock that ass! This beat right here is called that beat. It's like a bounce loop that we have. It's like a... Uh, a different uh different bounce elements mixed together to make that beat you'll hear that beat right there under a lot of bounce music right there this next song i got is called jenny my system Breakdown part, like right before the Wayne uh, come in, they has a blank spot right there. Uh, I don't know why that, why that was blank. <laughs> and that, that's like for some reason that's empty on some of the, some of the versions. Like I don't know if that was a mistake that they did or whatever uh, when they put the record out, but it's originally. <laughs> Drake was like, it would have been nice to have Wayne on, on this one. I kind of surprised him with that or whatever, woo -de -woo. I, uh, I said, you know what, since he spoke about it, let me go ahead on the Yes Lord it right quick. Found some Wayne vocals on the internet. <laughs> Faps came in right um, on Drake's verse. And I added a little scratch. But the new me is really still the real me. I swear you gotta feel me. Yeah, you're right. 
Okay, so you had to go to the internet to get Lil Wayne on the record? Wait, wait use your mic. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, uh, it was a right there and thing. It was a right there moment for me. I'm out there in Toronto, so, you know, I'm like, I'm just trying to get the job done. I ain't got time for them to be trying to call Wayne and all this. But you know him, right? Yeah. You could just pick up the phone and yeah. say, Yeah, so, like, but I ain't want to go through all that. I was like, let's get this over with. Now, all I needed was a couple of words to chop up, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it was piece did, of cake. Did they ever bother clearing the sample? Oh, yeah, all well, that was good. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was good. All right, well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate yeah. it. And that is a really cool explanation of you know the science that goes into yeah. putting these records together which for people like me who were not technical in that way it's it's super fascinating to see how you do it just out of curiosity that interview that they did with you was that in your studio or was that like a tv set uh i did that interview in la okay yeah the studio in la all right gotcha do you work mostly here in New Orleans, or do you just go wherever the work takes oh, you? Oh no, my the hit factory is here in New Orleans. Yeah, every every mostly everything I do is here. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna we got a lot to talk about. Um, yeah. But so, needless to say, you're born and raised in New Orleans, right? Right. So, what neighborhood did you grow up in? Uptown, Third Wall. Okay. Yeah. Um. Was music something that you were always interested in as a kid, even going back to you know your early childhood? Yeah, yeah, it's music, just always music. Uh, I was in a band. Really? Yeah, I marched on um, for John Mac Twenty Eight and, and John Mac Senior High School. What did you play? Uh, trumpet. Yeah. What other instruments do you play? Uh, piano. Uh, I'm I'm learning the guitar a little more, so. Yeah. Awesome. Um, was there music, you know, like in your house when you were growing up? Were there, you know, people that also played music in your family and friends and that, and that environment? Were there, was, was that a big part of what was happening? Yeah, my mom would always play music, play a lot of Michael Jackson. Yeah, a lot of uh, Stephanie Mills and, you know, just a lot of R&B music mostly. Uh, New edition and stuff like that. And, uh, every Christmas, I would I would get a uh, like a keyboard or something musical. Uh, I don't know if you know this. Remember this little toy? It was a toy you could put a tape in there, uh -huh. and it had a little microphone on the side of it, and you could you know what I'm saying. So yeah. I used to always get one of them, and I uh, and I used to always just walk around recording myself. So just to press the R E C button, that red button. I was a producer already. <laughs> <laughs> I was on. I was on the stuff, so yeah. So everybody knew that music was your thing, even from a young child? Yes. What's your earliest musical memory? If you could cast your mind all the way back to as young as you can go. Uh, I remember, uh, I remember I got, I got so excited when I had did, I, I uh, made my first beat, and uh, I called all my friends inside, and I instantly knew what I wanted to do from there. And uh, they thought it was a game, because every day all we did was play football and basketball outside. And I kind of switched up. Like, I was into, I was always into electrical stuff. Like, I would break my remote control cars and stuff and hooking wires up and, like, you know what I'm saying? So I was always into stuff like that. And, uh, yeah. You know that was that was that, that's a day I never forget. I called all my friends inside and I let them hear my beats that I had made. And I made the beats. It was crazy the way I made the beats because I made the beats like I remember it was like a heavy D beat and uh, maybe some James Brown music or something. And I would have like two radios sitting right there, and I'm trying to sync them up and sync, you know, just sync. I got the tape player over here, but to put the, the paper at the top of the tape to record over my mama gospel CD. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was crazy. And how old were you at that point? Uh, I was maybe eight, nine, about nine years old. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you were growing up, was, I mean, you talked about, you know, Michael Jackson and Stephanie Mills and things like that that were, that were in the house, but were you, 
am aware of or paying attention at all to um, not just hip hop and rap music, but like some of the traditional New Orleans stuff, like you know Mardi Gras Indians or brass bands or things like that. Was that in the in the mix oh, yeah, when you most, were a kid? Most definitely, most definitely. My family, my family from Clebone Avenue. We was uptown. We was in the midst of all that. You know what I'm saying? So it was. I was always fascinated by DJs. Going, to, you know what I'm saying? Going in a project or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Just speakers. Ugly and loud. You remember them old speakers back in the days? It was yeah. ugly compared to the speakers now. Yeah. And uh, you know, like hearing two live crew, and uh, you know, just the rap music or whatever. It was just crazy. You know what I'm saying? You know, hip hop was like in the '80s and the early '90s or whatever. It was, you know, N.W.A. and stuff like that or whatever. So it was crazy. You know what I'm saying? It was it was young. So, but, but, and that was around the period, late 80s, early 90s, when yeah. bounce music really first yeah. emerged. Yeah. It just kind of evolved and showed up out of nowhere. Right. Um, what's your take on how it, you know, was born as a, as a style unto itself? Trigger man. <laughs> Trigger man, man, just that beat, man. That, that beat, like, everybody love that beat instantly when you hear it. So even when the DJs played the instrumental, they'll play the instrumental. I remember back in the days, whatever, and people would just rock out to the instrumental, or whatever, and uh, yeah. But just to get the MC to get on top of it, like, you know what I'm saying, like T.T. T. Tucker, a Juvenile in the Project, just rapping over the beat, it was just crazy. You know? I interviewed T.T. T. Tucker many years ago, yeah. and he, he told about, his he getting him start, his start just yeah. basically playing and uh, at DJing at courtyard parties in the projects yeah. and just playing records and just doing where they at where they at you know on yeah. top and hollering in the mic and getting people hyped up and calling out different neighborhoods and different stores or places that people would know and it was always very much a you know very local specific like. Yeah. This is us, this is our town, this is our neighborhood, this is our thing. Yeah, it's crazy, like, cause when I be out of town, and uh, I be like, man, these people missing that. They need that. They need somebody to go on this stage and run that Trigger Man beat and get somebody up on this stage like T.T. T. Tucker to get it popping, you know what I'm saying? So I be, I be thinking like that or whatever, just thinking out the box when I be out of town. And one of the things to me that was always I mean, like, I'm not from here originally, so when, like, in the early 90s, I, I have vivid memories of driving down Louisiana Avenue with the radio on and just listening to Q93 or FM98 or something like that, and it'd be one bounce song after the next. Yeah. Like, just, and I was shocked because the commercial radio was playing local records. Yeah. Like that didn't happen in rock music. Yeah. You know, that there was no support for local music and the other styles, but bounce was such a big phenomenon that it was on the commercial radio. But yeah. I was even more like dumbfounded because every single record had the Trigger Man beat. Yeah. And so they all sounded very, very consistent from one to the next. And it, I mean, how, how, did, how, did, how did people get away with all making this records with the same sample in it and everybody still being able to sell copies and be successful? Because at the end of the day, that sound, that sound lets you know what it is. It, it, first of all, it's going to let you know that, all right, this is, this is some people from New Orleans who created it, first of all. And, uh, you know, and, and second is, is keeping that tempo to what everybody like, you know what I'm saying, which is, is, is important, you know what I'm saying. Even in, in music today, like if you was to sample a Whitney Houston record or a Madonna record that somebody, everybody know, it's going to probably instantly hit, you know what I'm saying, because it's familiar with the air. And that's what it is with the bounce music, like, you know what I'm saying, like it's familiar to our ears, you know what I'm saying, and we, and we love it. And it, it, I, I was always struck by the kind of similarity between like if you if you put a bounce record on or if there's a brass band going down the street and they drop that snare drum same reaction the people in the street have the exact same reaction when a brass band goes by or a bounce beat 
starts. It's like instant party. Everybody just starts busting a move all, all at the same time. Right. It's like, what is it about that New Orleans thing that just makes people want to move? Because we, is, is, we got a lot, we got a lot of, and my feelings going on in this city, you know what I'm saying? Like, every, <laughs> everybody feel each other. What's ever going on is a lot of pain, is a lot of struggle. You know what I'm saying? We is a small city, but it's a lot going on. We're a small city with a big heart, and uh, you know we just stay true. We just stay true to ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Like you know, everybody come out and and, and gonna support our jazz music, our second line bands. You know what I'm saying? Like so, you know, it's never a dull moment in that. Like you know what I'm saying? And and that's what I love about it too. Like we stay true to what we love and who we is. Right on. I want to come back in a minute to Bounce and you know the specifics of Bounce and where it's gone and where it's, where it's going. Yeah. But in the meantime, I, w I wanted to ask you, like when you were first starting, you talked about being interested in taking things apart and connecting wires and recording sounds and things like that. But when you were you know, becoming aware of, of being able to do this and wanting to do that, was it your ambition at the beginning to be an artist, or did you always want to be a producer? Uh, well, I, I started out rapping first, but I was making my own beats. So, uh, but I was more into making the beats than the rapping thing. And, uh, man, just, just, just finding pro when, when, the, when the computer thing came about and, and the, 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 the Fruity Loop and and all that, and Acid Pro, and all that came about like that was like that. That just took my mind into. I just want to create music. Like I just want to be creative. I want to sit in front of this computer 24/7 and never move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was it. That's what you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, well, can you talk a little bit more about the kinds of equipment? that was available to you at the very beginning? We were just upstairs talking with, with some of the, the young people that are making music now, and they've got you know really cool like Macintosh computers yeah. with Ableton software and things like that, which are all like kind of modern developments that I'm guessing make the technical aspect a little bit easier, but I'm, I have a feeling that when you were first starting, it wasn't quite that sophisticated. Nah, nah, not what I had, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, my mom didn't really have too much, so I would get the little toys, I would get the little Casio keyboards, or whatever, so I was always familiar familiar with the uh, pianos or whatever, and being able to keep up with rhythm, you know what I'm saying, I always had rhythm, and uh, you know, like, you know, around 99, 2000, I was introduced to the MPC or whatever, uh, the MPC 2000, and you know, it was it was it was it was different when I hopped on a computer and I got to the Fruity Loops or whatever. It just the 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 software made me just want to create more. I don't know why, you know what I'm saying? Like it just made me just more into what was going on than uh just being on an MPC or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like I learned the MPC like that. It was it was nothing. But uh the computer just was moving fast. It was a lot coming out. And I just, I just had to get with the program, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. It was just always the same old thing, going to the studio, working on, on the MPC, I guess, with just the equipment that I had. And, uh, yeah, once Fruity Loop came along and Acid Pro and this program, I had Jammer Pro, it was, it was on and popping. Did you have any people helping you at the beginning, teaching you how to use this stuff or showing you how it worked or, I mean, did you have any, you know, mentors or anything like that or did you really just figure everything out on your own? No, I ain't never had nobody to ever show me anything. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I took that and I, I sat there for hours until I figured it out. Yeah, I spent a lot of time, I spent more time figuring it out <laughs> than anything. Uh, it, it, got, it got crazy for me, like, it's like I was addicted into, you know, I was addicted to it or whatever. And did you also use, like, those drum pad things that make the, the beats and... Oh, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. You like, guys know about the equipment stuff much more than I do. Yeah, the MPC or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I said, once that software came out or whatever, that, uh, that fruited a little bit, just, it was addictive. 
in order to do this, to make beats, to use computers to make music, things like that, do you think that it's important to be a musician first or have some sort of musical understanding or ability in order to be able to do all that? Nah, it, it don't even matter what, what you use to make, make the sound that you're trying to make. Like, you know, they got people even even um, doing sounds for movies. It's crazy how they create sounds. Like, they may take and, and use that for a sound. So it don't even, it don't even matter what, what you use to make the sound. Just as long as you can make it sound good, you know. But I would think that you have to have some sort of internal, like, musical sense. I don't been in a studio where they got stuff that look like it don't even do nothing. And if you get close to it, it'll make a sound. You know what I'm saying? So it, it don't matter. You use MPC, you use software, it, it don't even matter. As long as you're good at what you're doing, you believe in it, you know, so. What were the first studios that, like, what kind, I mean, what were some of the studios where you first did your work? Was it all just at home on a computer, or did you go to any? In my house, in my bedroom. Yeah, that was it, huh? With a with a skinny mic, computer microphone, and I recorded plenty of songs on it. I was even doing studio time, you know, had people in my mama house. She come in the room busting that tripping. Sometimes she'll come and offer some food. You know. <laughs> you know, so she played a major part in the beginning as well. She just let me be, let me do what I do. What was the first record that you ever worked on that actually got released? Uh, Big Freedom, um, Jen and My System. Yeah. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, how, how did that collaboration come about? How did you get to know Big Frida? How did you start working together? Uh, man, Frida was signed to a record label uh, during the time I was in high school. Uh, I became a pro the main producer of that record label. It was called Money Rules Entertainment. Uh, the guy named was KT, and uh, he used to work with a record label called Mobile Joe back in the days, which um, had like Cheeky Black and and some other people or whatever, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I signed with that record label, and uh, it had Big Frida, it had Sissy Noble, Tim Walbuck, uh, Gotti Boy Chris. It just it just had a lot of. Uh, Local bounce artists or whatever, trying to be the next take for mm -hmm. or whatever, the new take for which with the sound of the sound now or whatever, the bounce sound now. So, yeah. And the first beat that I did for Frida, Frida couldn't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was over for me right then and there. I'm like, man, I can't make it. It's over with. But uh, I just stayed true to myself and I uh, did my homework, went back in there and we got back in the lab again after that. Frida couldn't get rid of me. It was over, wow. over with. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been on ever since. When did you first start to get an understanding that you could actually make money doing this? When I signed to that record label, uh, yeah. When I signed to that record label, I was in high school. Um, I was in 11th grade. and. Uh, they gave me a little check, gave me a little chain, bought me some Reeboks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, and from that was all good, you know. Uh, I was DJing, started DJing or whatever for a little while. Got hot doing that, I guess, because I was, I was, the music that I was making, and then me putting my name out there, and I'm, I'm getting booked the DJ to even play my own music or whatever, you know, and people just even wanted to see who that was. You know, they name me here all the time, you know what I'm saying? There's music on the street, music in the clubs, all day 24-7. So, on the street DJing, house parties, clubs, you know, then, I, then it wind up, I started moving around DJing, different states. Were you always able to make your living doing music, or did you ever have to like work a straight job of some sort in order to pay the bills? Last time I had a job, I probably was in 10th grade, 11th grade, like a regular job. I was working at a car wash uptown on Chavatulas. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. 
been all music ever since. Yeah. All right. Well, to, like you said, to be able to do what you love. Yeah. <laughs> like the saying goes, do what right. you love and you never work a day in your life. Right. Um, so you have a long association with Master P. Yeah. Can you talk about how you first met him, how, how that collaboration first came about? I met Master P a long time ago when I first bought his CD, and he don't even know it. <laughs> well, he know it now. But uh, now, nah, man, Master P cool, man. We business partners or whatever. Uh, I hooked up with Master P in the late 2013. Uh, became the main producer over there. Uh, produced like eight records for him. Uh, did some music, did some records for his son Romeo. Uh, I already worked with almost all the No Limit soldiers anyway, like you know, Mr. Magic and Fiend and Mill X and everybody already. But the uh, hook up with P was, I ain't think that was gonna ever happen. That's crazy. And uh, you know, P, cool person. I learned a lot from him. Very business minded. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's all about business with him. But, uh, you know, I got, to, I got to be around P a lot, around his family, uh, go to church with him, you know what I'm saying, do a lot of, you know, personal things with him or whatever. And, uh, one thing I learned about P is, you know, he love making music. Like, he love what he do. He like rapping, you know. So. Um, just some other... Names curious if you had some association with them, like Mia X. Did yeah. you work with her at all? Yeah. Mystical? Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, Mia X and uh, Magnolia Shorty, I had them in the studio together. Together on a oh, record. That must yeah. Have been amazing. Yeah, that was crazy. Wow. Did you ever work with G Slim or no G Slim? Uh, no, I, I wish I would have. No. He, he's still yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah. I love that record, that Four Deuces and Trace record. What? I just, I just, I just think that's, that's one of the great, it's one of the great, you know, yeah. West Coast style hip hop records that's I ever come out of New Orleans. Record. I, I remade that record. And, uh, what? Yeah. You I re remade I, the record? I remade the record and I uh, sent it to Chuck. I sent it to Partners in Crime. I sent it to everybody that was ever on Big Boy. And uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm a G Slim fan. Yeah, me too. Yeah. But you never worked with them? Never. I was before my time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I guess mine too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Fifth Floor Weeby yeah. is somebody that you've also had a long association with. Can you talk about that, how you got to know him? Because I think he also was very instrumental in, in some of your more recent collaborations. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, man Weeby been hooked up. Uh, in, in the, before Hurricane Katrina, we hooked up or whatever. Uh, I was with a record label called Big Face Records. And uh, he wound up coming mess with us over there for a little while. And uh, yeah, man, we we've been we've been cool ever since. Uh, we we done worked on plenty plenty records since then. So we got a we got a little history or whatever, you know. That's why he knew who to call on when <laughs> when he got that call. <laughs> so yeah. the story has been told a bunch of times yeah. now that to, you, you know your work with Drake. Yeah. They call Weeby. Yeah, they call Weeby. Now, Weeby did he end up on the record too? Yeah, he ended up on the record. He was on a record on the Nice for What record. He, uh, yeah, in the uh, second half of it. Okay, but they were like, "Hey, you know, we want yeah. a, a producer." It was, it, it was more, it was more on a on a production side or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So, and he recommended you. Yeah. Did you solid? Huh? Uh, he did you solid. Oh yes, Lord. <laughs> 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 yes, Lord. So. All right. Uh, you know, now you're like on stage at the Superdome and stuff. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> or I guess the Smoothie King, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, but again, congratulations on, on the success because it's, it's just fantastic. Um, you're known as a bounce producer, right. but you've also worked on other styles of records oh, yeah. as well, right? Yeah. So when you're approaching a record, is there a difference in your mind or your the approach that you use between making a bounce record and say making a hip hop record? Um, it's, I don't know, I, I just, I don't know. I just, <laughs> I just be me, I just be me. It's, it all feel the same to me. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a producer, like I, I, don't, I don't see, it's no difference to me whether it's bounce 
R&B, hip hop, or what, you know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, it's just about being creative. Right. And, uh, and being a genius at it. <laughs> That's love. You a genius, as they say. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, I want to open this up for questions in just a second, but I have a couple more. Um, in your mind, how do you feel Bounce has changed or evolved um, since the early days? How, how, do you think the style is, is similar to what it was then? Has it changed very much? What's, what's your feeling on Bounce as a sound? We have, uh, you know, it's bounce. Bounce is a, is a, is a is a big genre because you got you got different type of bounce sounds. You got you got different rhythms, even in the jazz side. Like you got different type of jazz. You know, uh, we got our different type of bounce uh, sounds. But it's like you say, like every record gonna always had that trigger man in it. So, you know. It's, it's gonna always have that same element from the throwback bounce, mm -hmm. and you know, that's just what it is. Right. You know, ain't no taking that from that or whatever. You know, if you hear a jazz record, you gonna know it's jazz. Red is is second line jazz or uh, brass, whatever. It's gonna have brass in it. It's gonna, you know, what I'm saying. So, yeah. But it seemed to me f like for a while there was bounce music that was coming out that was being called bounce. But it, to me, it didn't sound like bounce because it was missing the trigger man. Yeah. And there was a, a lot of, you know, scratching and 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 shouting and stuff. Um, but it seemed like that essential element. Did you know what I'm saying? Like there there was yeah. an, some essential, like bounce character. Like traditional yeah. New Orleans jazz is not New Orleans jazz yeah. unless it has certain things right. in it. Right. And bounce, like it's got to have certain things. Right. And it just seemed like that was missing. But that it's slowly kind of getting back into it. It's every every bounce record don't necessarily have the trigger man in it. It is 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 more of a spiritual, energetic type thing. Like you just gotta know, like like juvenile back that thing up. It don't have trigger man in it or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But it have that bottom that the trigger man beat uses. You know what I'm saying? That same pattern. And you know, and it has the breakdowns that that you would usually put in a bounce song. So, you know, that's how you identify that or whatever. You know, it's a bounce record. But uh, yeah, they have they have plenty of bounce records that don't use Trigger Man or whatever. But it's gonna have some type of element to it to to let you identify what it is. Yeah. It's you know when you talk about like the st be like kind of fancy about it, the state of bounce music today or whatever. It doesn't seem like there were that many artists that are out there like really doing it. You know, Frida, of course, um, but like you don't really hear that much about people like Sissy Nobi, uh, Mystical, of course, he's, you know, locked up. Um, Oh, it's about to get real now. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, you had Nikki to be, he's dead. Um, yeah. You know, there's just, there's not that many people that are out there really pushing it. Where are the, the bright lights for, for Bounce these days? Well, it's, it's, like, it's like this, man. It's like some of those people been working for a long time. You know, a lot of people got a lot of personal things going on in their life. You know, and and some things it be it be hard sometimes. You know, to to really stay focused at it, or whatever. And some people just, you know, step in the wrong step on the wrong side of the road, and uh, you know, free to stay consistent. You know, what I'm saying free to surround yourself with the right people, or whatever, to make yourself go where you need to go. Even me, you know, what I'm saying I had to surround myself with the right people, and uh. You know, all that all that plays a part or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like, is you, you still gotta learn the business side of it. You know what I'm saying? And you know, if you don't if you don't if you don't know the business side, like it's it's cool to just be in the studio and work and be talented and all that. But the the really get your music more out and more places is gonna take business. So, you know. New Orleans gets knocked a lot for not having much by way of music business. Yeah. 
and here you are, you know, you're on one of the biggest record, co-producer of, you know, some of the biggest records that there are in the world at the moment. Yeah. Again, congratulations. Yeah, it's appreciate pretty that. Pretty awesome. <laughs> um, is it hard to be successful in the music business while being based in New Orleans? Nah, not at all. No. It's, uh, my city love me. I'm cool, like, <laughs> I'm good, I ain't tripping, you know, I, I, like, you know, I've been putting it down, I've been holding it down for a long time or whatever, and, uh, you know, just being 100, man, just being 100 with, it, with myself first or whatever, and, you know, just trying to stay consistent. Well, as some friends of mine say, they do have flights to Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, I've been, I, I spent a lot of time in L.A. or whatever. That's like my second home or right. whatever. That's, you know, that's because I had st I signed with No Limit or whatever and everything. But, uh, nah, I ain't leaving New Orleans. Yeah, no. I ain't going nowhere. No, I would imagine not. Mm -mm, nah, nah. <laughs> Um, if anybody has a question, if, the, if, if they could just please use that microphone over there so that the folks listening at home can hear you. In the meantime, I've, I've just got one or two last ones that I want to ask. Um, don't rush. Uh, um, so we were talking about bounce and like kind of the state of things today and how few artists it seems like are out there, you know, really... Um, making a lot of noise, but then over the past, I don't know, 10 years or so, it seems like there's been a never-ending parade of people taking little bits and pieces of the bounce sound. I mean, everybody from Rihanna to a Beyonce to, you know, everybody seems to want a little bit of that to give a little bit more excitement to their records. Well, you know, that, that's something that's been happening for years. You know, it's, you know, like even going back to when music was just sheet music, you know, like how you think people used to distribute music, like, you know what I'm saying? It was through sheets, like, and you had club, bands and clubs that, you know, had to play people music from off of paper. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's just, that's just the way you gotta move the music around. Bounce, bounce like went crazy for Katrina, like when it went everywhere, you know what I'm saying? They scattered everybody all over the place or whatever. And, uh, you know, with, with Rihanna and Beyonce and Drake and everybody using the bounce elements, that's cool. Like, that's, that's what's up, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's something that's been going on for a long time, though. Like, even, like, this record with, with Drake, um, the In My Feelings of the Nice For What, like, Drake used, used something from me before them records or whatever. Like, he used uh, the record called She Wrote It Like a Soldier that I also produced down here, whatever. He used that on his last album. So, whatever, you know, but I didn't physically touch that, so it wasn't really talked about too much. He just sampled it. Right. But, um, Now, I mean, I'm sure you've, you're familiar with the comments that people make online about how, oh, they're stealing our sound, yeah. and they're, you know, they're disrespecting us, and, you know, they're stealing it, and all this kind of thing. Did, what's, what's your take on all that? I guess everybody been stealing from somewhere. Huh? If uh, if Jay Z sampled uh, somebody music that was from Oakland, I guess Jay Z must have stole somebody's sound. You know what I'm saying? So I don't I don't I don't feel no type of way about about that type of stuff, man. You know, at the end of the day, like I say, everybody just trying to be creative. You know what I'm saying? And everybody just you know, if you hear something you like or you love, you are gonna mess with it. You know, so I wouldn't knock the next person from doing that. Like, if, if I hear something that I like from some, from something else, I'm gonna use it. Like, and if I hear some Mexican sounds, I'm, I'm putting that in my beat. Is it is what it is? That's just me being creative. Right. Well, you and know? people have been doing that for yeah, forever. Yeah, forever. Like, that ain't nothing new. But in this case, I mean, it seems like Drake made like a really honest effort. He says, okay, I want to put the New Orleans sound in there. Yeah. Okay. Who's got the New Orleans sound? Who's the guy? Who's the go-to? Let's get him on the record. Yeah, it's a, it's a respect thing, man. Like, he, Drake, Drake did it right. He did it right. Uh, you know, he called on, you know, people that was from New Orleans or whatever. And, you know, he represented. He held it down. He kept his word. You know what I'm saying? And, Featured you know, it in the videos, yeah, the whole you know, thing. And, you know, really made it clear. Every, everybody can do that. You know what I'm saying? But, 
you know, like the way he did it or whatever, he came down there and did all that, you know what I'm saying? Because he knew we care, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, like, you know, he got his break from us. So he felt like he owed us and everything. So it's all good. Right on. Did you have a question? Yes, please. Yeah, just pull, that, pull the mic down. <clears throat> so with your, is it on? Hello? Okay, there we go. So um, with your recent like success and like, you know, having someone from out of town, you know, put you on, well, I ain't gonna say put you on, um, but you know, took you global in a way. So with that success, like, would you take that and, you know, try to help someone from the city? Most definitely. I might try to help you today. Let's go. I'm about to think about it. I ain't got number time on my hands. You know, but I think yeah. that's what she was hoping you'd say. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, most definitely. Um, I always, I always been a person that always uh, worked with people. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, that nobody could ever step up and say, Black, what about me, or uh, this or that, you know what I'm saying? Like, I always, you know what I'm saying, help people, work with people. Um, for years, I took less of money than I deserved producing beats for a lot of people, uh, you know, and having people record in my studio and everything, just because of the love that I have for it, especially if I believed in a person. You know what I'm saying? If it was a rapper or a singer that I liked it, or whatever, shit, I'll call them and tell them, man, look, where you at, what you doing? You need to come to the studio, we need to make some music. So, but yeah, most definitely, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for talent to work with, new talent, new people, yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> all right, we're rolling now. Hmm. Let me see, all right. You probably knew this was coming. So send Drake. How many national artists have reached out to you? <laughs> uh, it's I don't had a few few artists uh, reach out to me. Uh, you know, on the business side, it's the la the major labels who reach out, uh, like Universal and a lot of the A uh, and R for the rappers or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Just to try to get the songs together or whatever. You know, gather beats or whatever. So I don't I don't send sent a lot of beats out to a lot of major labels. Uh, I have a few artists that I did work with. I just don't want to speak on it yet or whatever because it's, it's in the making. And I don't want to speak on it be like, no, he ain't getting on this album. They take the record away. But uh, yeah, I, I done got a lot more coming. Trust me. One more question. Um, when was the moment, like, what was the moment that you realized that this is like real for you. Which part? When you say this, what do you mean? Once I figured out this, what I wanted to do, this is what you're like, How do I say this? Like, when did it hit you that this is really like gonna do something for you? When I, when the first time I got in the studio and I got to get around some real equipment, that's when I know it was real for me. Uh, and I never looked back. All right. Yeah. All right, next question. So um, I had a question about like, with other producers, like from like, how would you, like, how do you usually work with other producers? Like, do you usually help them out if they're young or if they're like, um, like a famous producer, like Master P, like how do you work with them? Um. Uh, let's put it as if me and you was working together in the studio, all right? Uh, so we'll vibe out in the studio. We'll come in there, chill. You eat? You good? You straight? You want something to drink? All right. Believe that. Uh, now, nah, what it is, man, you, you just get in the studio and, and you know, we, we vibe out. We, we, we figure out where we want to go with it. You know what I'm saying? It all depends on if we're working on a record for somebody or either if we're just going in there and vibe out and making some beats. You might be like, Black, look, I got this sound like I want you to hear. You can add some drums to it. I may add some drums to it, then you might be like, and come and add some more percussion to it or whatever, or it might be vice versa. So we'll just be in the studio just vibing out and coming up with sounds. I've been in the studio, I've been in a session where they had like maybe 10 different producers, right? And all over the room they just had 
keyboards, guitars, drums, all kind of stuff. And everybody was making music at the same time. You know how noisy that was? So if you didn't have the love for this, you would have got out there. But we sat in there for like about 45 minutes and just was making music until everybody got on the same chord and we really came up with something nice and we laid it down and recorded it. So it's just about just going in the studio vibing out. Um, I, was, I, was another, I have another question. For like upcoming people who try to like write and like rap or something like that, what, do you, what type of advice do you have for them? Wait, I'll repeat that? Like for people who like try to write or like try to become a rapper, what type of advice do you have for them? Uh, is 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 always gonna be a different time in the game, so it's just it's just really just knowing what's what's going on during the time that you're trying to do what you're trying to do. It's it's gonna always look. It's gonna always be a different way that somebody get on, in 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 a different time. You know what I'm saying? Somebody might get on in on Facebook. Somebody might get on from MySpace back in the days, Instagram, YouTube. You just you just gotta just be with what was going on or whatever. You know, they got millions of rappers. They got millions of studios. You got everybody trying to do the same thing at the same time. So you just gotta try to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, you gotta believe in yourself. And you gotta try to do something different. You can't try to do the same thing your neighbor doing or the same other people trying to do. You gotta try to do something different. And then you gotta surround yourself with the right type of people. You know what I'm saying? You got to surround yourself with people that believe in you and that can help you. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. How does a young person who is just trying to break in get their name around, get collaborations going? How do, how do, they, you know, how do they start to get some traction? If you were just starting out today, what would, what would be some of the moves that you'd be making? Man, as far as the day, you know, is the youngsters got it better than well, how everybody else had it because they got Instagram. They got Instagram, they got YouTube, they got phones. I wish I could record it when I first was doing what I was doing on the phone, you know what I'm saying? Like they got, they got so much now, you know what I'm saying? So it's not really too hard to really get yourself out there. You know, it's, it's just about just using, using those tools that's, that's easy for you to get yourself out there and, and working them right. So if one of these record labels want you, besides no limit, like would you know like which one to choose? That's where your manager come in place, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and your lawyer. Right. Your manager and your lawyer come in place. I got one more question. Secondary question is, have you ever worked with an artist that made you just like I don't want to work with you because your vibe is off and your attitude is just like not right. Like, Bro, I work, I work with people that I love working with every day. Sometimes it be like that sometimes in the studio. It, sometimes you have your days, sometimes you don't, you know? Yeah. But if they talented, you're going to have to deal with it, buddy. <laughs> you think just because Drake come in the studio and have a bad day, I'm gonna be like, no, I'm gonna just have to deal with it. You know. Um, what advice do you have to independent upcoming artists as far as like the business side of music? Any words of precaution or anything like that? Um, I'm gonna keep it real with you, off of what I know, how I feel about certain things. Like, you know, I just want to stay focused on the creative side. Um, my manager, Jay Will, over here, you know, he been with me for a long time. He on the business side of everything or whatever. I'd rather him just deal with that or whatever. If there's certain things that I need to know, I ask him. Uh, you know, you can, it's good to learn about the business or whatever, you know what I'm saying? But that's what they got those people for, managers and lawyers or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So it's important to have you a good manager, have you a good lawyer. And, uh, you know. Is that what you did first? 
like found a manager with people who knew about business before you entered the music business? Oh, I, I got I didn't have a manager at first at one point in time, you know what I'm saying? So if I had a manager I probably things would have probably started off better for me, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people wouldn't have got over on me like they got over on me, but yes, Lord, it's all good. You hear me? <laughs> but yeah, that's important. Like I say, you gotta surround yourself with the right team. You know, you gotta have a team. You know, ain't nobody out here doing it by yourself. But it's hard to get people on your team until you've already shown that you've got something going. Right. So no, you, it's really up to you at the beginning. Ain't, ain't none of it easy. You know what I'm saying? Ain't none of it easy, man. Just finding, finding the right people to get around you to believe in you and all that. You know, it's, it's a journey, but you, gotta, you just got to be strong enough to take it. But I, I think your point is, right, that it, it's self-motivation. Yes. Yeah. You got to be wanting to do it. You got to be gotta willing be, to do it at all cost. You got to be wanting to do it, yeah. And then after you get a little traction and you get some notoriety and people start to hear your music oh, yeah. a little bit, then all of a sudden some of the other people that can help you will yeah. come to you. But they're not going to come along first. Yeah, they're not going to come along first. You got to, you got to, they got to see what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? You got to get yourself out there. You got to put something out there. Then you're going to start attracting those type of people that's going to want to work with you and want to do things for you. Hi. Um, I don't know if you had to deal with this at, uh, at all or much, but probably when you were starting out, did people flake and show up late all the time? And if so, how did you cope with the frustration from that? <laughs> um, wow. Well, we are talking about music. <laughs> we're talking about uh, music. So, I mean, what, what are the odds that somebody's going to flake and show up late? Uh, as far as like coming to the studio yeah. and, and stuff or like that? Yeah, or meeting up to practice or, you know, trying to make a group with you and just being kind of difficult to nail down. Um, it was never, that, that probably wasn't never a big problem. Maybe the problem was if somebody was, was the city coming and don't come or don't show, that would, that would probably be it. But uh, as far as the late, it, that don't really get serious until you really, really like when money involved. When mo once once big money involved in your time and hey, look, we paying you for to be here for this certain time, then that's when it probably becomes a problem. But coming up now, nah, we we all good. We trying to make it together, man. You you twenty minutes later, right? It's all good. We gonna get it going. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Black. Uh, were there any other like specific producers who you looked up to, who inspired you when you were starting out? You know, like you know, internationally, nationally, locally. You know what's crazy, bro? You know, uh, locally, you already know, man, and Fresh KLC. You know, uh, Beast by the Pound. You know, uh, DJ Duck, Money Fresh. You know, a lot of you know the locals, but. I'm still learning about producers, like people that play guitar for Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson, and you know, I'm, I'm still learning my favorite producers. Like this, it, it goes on and on. They got so many people that done made music that I composed. Music is, music is crazy, you know what I'm saying? So right now, like, I'm crazy about Teddy Riley. Like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm, it's, it's crazy, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like. I don't. I don't. Uh, I've been talking with a lot of uh, music producers. Um, they they even were artists back in the '80s, and uh, they just got so many producers out there, man. That don't, that don't composed a lot of good music. You never know who you might like. I just do my homework on a lot of stuff like that, though. But I'm into that. Yeah. Please. So I got a question about, <clears throat> excuse me, about the beats. Like this whole city is kind of built on beats, yeah. whether it's brass band or funk or second line. And then when hip hop came around, it added another layer of beats. Yeah. You know, we're just rhythms. If your rhythm stops, you die. So what is it, when you hook onto a beat, what is it that's in the beat? Is it the bass drum? Is it the crack of the snare? Is it where the bass drum falls in time? Like, what, what is it about the beat that, because there's beats all over, but there's some that stand out over others. 
My thing is, my favorite part of the beat is what I can do without anything else. With if, whatever I could do with my hands. So I would say the kick and the snare. Like, you know, I can sit here and kick, snare, you know what I'm saying? So the kick and the snare is everything to me in the beat. So you feel it first. Yeah. And you, whatever you're hitting, tin cans, the couch, yeah. pizza yeah. box, and then you translate it with the tech. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> do you do you ever actually like sit down on a drum kit and like kick the bass drum and hit the hi hat and that kind of thing, or is it always using a drum machine and that type of thing? Uh, well, since I'm on a go right now, I'm on a go so much, so yeah, it's, everything is on a machine right now. So, but um, yeah. Do you ever make records with um, with no samples at all? Plenty. Yeah. Most of the music I produce is without samples. What about live instruments? Do you use much of that in the studio? Yes, yes. I, uh, I have friends in Chicago. Uh, I even hooked up with Tommy McElroy. He produced it for En Vogue. I hooked up with him through Frida back in around 2008 or whatever. Uh, We've been cool, so I would send music to him sometimes or whatever to get some live music. I said, you know, I, I, I just send beats and drum sounds all over the place to get uh, different people feeling, so whatever, you know, so, yeah. But yeah, where we at? Anybody else? So, all right, so, so what's, what, yeah, somebody, uh, please come use the mic so the folks listening on the, on the interwebs can hear you. This is, I'm an out-of-towner, so my experience with bounce is like limited to last like six years. Um, but um, my introduction is actually through the sampling of like Curtis Mantronics and like old 80s electro records. So my question is, how do you move forward but still kind of pay homage to like Knowledge Me and other older 80s electro, just mainly like 808 stuff. Like, how do you look at that stuff and recontextualize it for your future productions? That's just gonna always be in in hip hop. That type of, you know, what I'm saying that that electrical. You know, that 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 come from that. You know, what I'm saying all that. So all that's a part of hip hop, man. And that just gonna always live through everything forever, you know what I'm saying? So ain't no getting away from that or whatever. And, and we, we paying homage to that, and no, even though we think we not or whatever, because that's where, that's where it come from, you know what I'm saying? That 80s electrical, that old throwback Shaka Khan beat, like, you know what I'm saying? That's that yes, Lord. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. So what's next for Black and Mild? What, what's, what's your next uh, venture? Oh, man, I'm trying to see if they're going to let me play in a couple of movies. Whatever, right. you know, I'm trying to do this moving thing. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> nah, uh, I'm just, uh, you know, just trying to go for, for, for as far as I can with this, man. I got, I got the love for the music thing. I always did. And, you know, I just, I'm just letting it take, take me where, you know, wherever it's going to take me. I understand that you have a, a new branding company that you just started. Uh, yeah. You a genius. Yes, Lord. Y-A-G. Yag. <laughs> All right. So is that up and running yet, or is that still in the formative stages? Yeah, we, we, we yes, Lord. We yes, Lord right now. We uh, putting it together or whatever. We're going we gonna to also do a fashion show as well for it. So. Is that going to stay headquartered here? Yeah, of course. It got to start here. Everything starts here. Okay. Well, yeah. there's a lot of people that have launched their careers here and then left town and never came back and they never like really built anything here and they didn't really do much to help develop the industry that they became successful in. So I'm just wondering if you have a, a take on a different way to handle all that. See, my mama don't play that. You know what I'm saying? She's not about to let me go nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> It ain't about to happen, so, you know, I love my mama to death, and, uh, you know, she, she love here, all our family here, so, you know. Well, you've got a great opportunity to, you yeah. know, build something for the city. Yeah. And to help all of the, the people that are also aspiring, and, you know, you've got a great opportunity. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Another question. 
Yeah, what, it, what inspired the name Black and Mild? <laughs> Bro, uh, a, friend of, a friend of mine from uh, middle school gave me that name. Uh, we was ribbing. I don't know if I went to school one day looking like a Black and Mild. <laughs> but that's how it came about. And uh, I hated it at first. I hated it. They went to calling me that name forever since that day. But when a, when a pretty girl called me black, she was like, you black and mild? I say, oh, you the prettiest girl in the school. <laughs> yeah, it's on empowerment. Yeah, that's me. What's that? <laughs> Who on the line? <laughs> I, and I ran with it. So, yeah. All right, what's up? All right, what advice do you have for new artists and like keeping their stuff like keeping their music like afloat and like popping, you know what I'm saying? Like, so like they like they stuff don't drop because I see a lot of new people, they come out and they like they mixes and stuff just sound like subpar. So how do you like, I don't know, just how would you, what advice would you give to just market your music better and like just make sure that it's like, 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 just make sure that they getting like clout off it, you know what I mean? Right, right. Like, like I said, man, y'all got, these days, it's, it's the platforms out there, you know what I'm saying? Y'all got the SoundCloud, y'all got the YouTube, y'all got the Instagram, y'all got so much going on, you know what I'm saying? Like, right now, it seems like people want to see, see you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, video, videos is, is, is important. Like, you know, like NBA Youngboy, he hot. Like, I don't really hear him too much on the radio, but he getting shows like crazy you know what i'm saying so whatever he doing i don't know what he doing is was making him hot i figure he must be you know outworking everybody he must be putting out more music and uh whatever but uh like i see the platforms out there you know what i'm saying like you don't even need radio that much really to even blow you know what i'm saying to be making some money to be out here to be hot like you know what i'm saying like so it's times are different from how it used to be or whatever you know yeah. Use those platforms. How do you They're feel important. about Spotify? Spotify, yes. I feel good about all that. <laughs> you get you get checks from all that. You know what I'm saying? If you could get a check from it, it's good. Ain't nothing wrong with it. You know what I'm saying? They got people getting you you could get a YouTube deal just from YouTube. Views, views and streams, that's important now. You know what I'm saying? People not Screaming record sales and all that, like it's streams, like Drake streams was through the roof like crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Just off of streams, just off of, you know what I'm saying? Like that's crazy. So times is different. Well, you know he didn't even put physical product out for, you know, weeks. And it was all just straight up streams. Yes, yes, Lord. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, use those platforms, man. Like the, Get get people to love you, like get gain no gain those fans, gain those views. You know what I'm saying? That's important. Any advice for people on how to maintain an original voice? <laughs> I guess use your regular voice, and not the <laughs> auto tune. <laughs> Uh, you know, the auto tune, cool. You know, at the end of the day, like people be trying to diss it, man. That's that's the wave. You know, you can't, when, when something is a wave, that's just a wave, that's just what it is. You know what I'm saying? Uh, when Michael Jackson was hot, everybody wanted the Thriller jacket. I had a Thriller jacket. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody wanted the Jerry Curl. So, you know, sometimes, you know, if, if you could follow the wave and go with the wave, that's, that's what you want to do, do it. You know what I'm saying? Just stick with it, believe in it. You know what I'm saying? If you're trying to be different do, and do something different, then do something different. Just whatever you do, just believe in it. And continue doing it. You know what I'm saying? Don't switch up. Don't make the don't let the wave switch up, switch you up. You know what I'm saying? And you was doing regular not, oh man, he doing that. I'm about to go do that. No, continue doing what you believe in. You know? Because like when Drake came along, it seemed like he was kind of the leader of a whole new wave of people that all wanted to sing and rap. Yeah. Like that everybody, all of a sudden now everybody's singing and it, be, it became a thing. And yeah. so now you have all these 
copycats and, and people who, who were trying to all do the same sound, but then somebody like him, it's like he is looking for, now he's looking for something original and different, yeah. and he found you. Yeah. And so even you know, some, somebody at that level is always looking for something unique and original and not the same as what everybody else is doing. It's crazy because I didn't expect the two records off his album that I touched was the biggest songs on the album. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I know for sure I thought it was like, boy, that Michael Jackson record going to be the one. But, uh, you know, um, I'm happy for that, man. Like, that feel good. That's, that's crazy, though. But Drake, Drake is, a, is, a artist, is the type of artist that believe in, his, his, believing in himself. And he stay true to what he do, man. Like, you know, he, he an R&B singer and a rapper. And so, and, but on his R&B side, he not afraid to be R&B, even though he a rapper. You know what I'm saying? Like, if he gonna be R&B, he be R&B. If he gonna sing about love, he gonna sing about love. And a lot of hardcore rappers might hate the man or, or talk bad about him, but he just staying true to just being himself and being creative. You know what I'm saying? And that's one thing I get about dude or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, I'm in the studio working with him. And as far as mixing his music down, I forgot Drake was a rapper, a hardcore gangster rapper. Like, he could talk some stuff. So I'm like, dang, I forgot about this Drake existed right here. You know what I'm saying? I got so caught up on the, on the singing Drake or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, yeah. Well, Obviously, those two songs became the big hit records because of your work uh -oh. on the record. And, and the work that you bring is representative of this city, of New Orleans, and clearly that's the sound that everybody around the world really craves. So c congratulations to you once again for representing New Orleans so well and taking it all around the world and, and all of your success. It's, it's really fantastic. And thank you so much for being here today. And thank you all for coming. I think that's going to wrap it up for now. Um, stay tuned to our website, syncupconference.com. That will have uh, all of the info on all of our upcoming workshops. Our next one is on the topic of DIY graphics for social media. So all you aspiring artists out there who are looking to get popular on Instagram and you need those snappy graphics and photos, come and find out from creative directors how to make that happen. Once again, Black, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you.